Hey guys, what's up? It's Eric with Advanced Level Automotive. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. Today, we're back here with this 2007. This is a Volkswagen Rabbit. If you guys don't remember, I did a video with this car about a year ago. It's actually been probably more than a year now that I think about it. Anyways, if you guys didn't watch that video, I will leave a link down in the description below where you can go back and watch it. But essentially, the car came in, it had a problem where the speedometer wasn't working, and all of the lights were lit up in the instrument cluster, basically like a Christmas tree. And after doing the diagnosis, we found out that we had a faulty ABS module. The module just would not communicate at all. It was completely dead. Unfortunately, the owner of the vehicle at the time did not want to spend the money to try to fix this thing because it basically came down to two options. Number one, we get a used module from the junkyard. However, I wasn't really sure if we were going to be able to install a used module in this thing because a lot of times these ABS modules have VIN numbers written into them and it can be really difficult to rewrite the VIN number in a lot of these used modules, especially when it comes to European cars. I know you guys have seen me do a lot with the Ford used ABS modules doing the PMIs. That's a really easy way to change the VIN number on the Fords. However, I wasn't sure if something like that was gonna work with the Volkswagen. And on top of that, buying a used module from the junkyard, there's still a 50-50 chance that that module might be bad as well. Now the other option was to go to the dealership and buy a brand new module. A brand new ABS module for this car from the dealership runs well over a thousand dollars and the owner just wasn't going to pay that. So basically the car just sat for over a year. Take a look at how much dirt this thing has accumulated. If you look at the hood you can see all of this here is pretty much embedded into the paint. It's going to have to get clay barred out and that's not even the worst part. Take a look at the roof. This is going to need some serious elbow grease. So anyways after letting the car sit for over a year they finally decided they wanted to go ahead and try to fix it. Now we were doing some research online and we found that there are some services where you can send your ABS module in to get repaired. And so that is an option that we looked at. However, that does involve some downtime. The car will have to sit for about a week while we wait for the module to get repaired and to get shipped back to us. So before deciding to go that route, I figured it would be worth a shot for us to go ahead and pull this module out, open it up, take a look, and see if maybe we can fix it ourselves. So let me take you guys under the hood and show you where the ABS module is located. All right, so taking a look under the hood, here we have our 2.5 liter engine, which if you guys didn't know, is made out of 95% biodegradable plastic. And so this is one of the most fuel efficient engines on the planet because it's so light. I'm just kidding you guys. Anyways, if you guys look way back here between the engine and the firewall, you'll find that our ABS module is crammed way down in there, right there. So I'm gonna start by removing this big plastic cover which houses our air filter. Once we get that out of the way, hopefully we'll be able to get a better look. Then we'll see what it's gonna take to get it off. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot to show you guys what it's doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the vehicle on. Let's crank this thing up. You can see the engine starts up right away, but if you look at the instrument cluster, you'll notice that we have pretty much all of these lights on. We've got the brake light on, ABS light. We got this hood open light. We got this guy getting hit with a dodgeball light. We got this DRL light. Up here, it looks like we got this water fountain light. Over here, it looks like we got this buoy floating in the ocean. Then over here, we got this EPC light. We've got the steering wheel light, and we even have a light light. By the way, I don't know if I forgot to mention, but the speedometer also does not work. So when you're driving, you don't know how fast you're going. So what does this all mean? I don't know. Let me take you guys over to the scan tool and show you what I found. All right, so here we have the scan tool. Today, we're using the Launch X431 Pad 5 and we're gonna go into Intelligent Diagnose. Now, the reason I wanna use this particular scan tool is because it's got a really cool function, which I'll show you in just a second here. So it read the VIN number, 2007 Volkswagen Rabbit, and we'll hit Diagnostic. So here we have the coolest feature about the scan tool. This is the topology map. I'm gonna go ahead and click on Smart Detection, and what this is gonna do is it's gonna scan all of the modules on the vehicle, and it's gonna let us know which ones are not communicating. So you can see right here, it's trying to communicate with the ABS module. It's trying to scan it, but uh, it seems like there's no feedback coming from that ABS module. Just give it a minute and you'll see that right there. It just skipped right over it. Now you can see it's scanning the rest of the modules. Everything else has communication here. Everything except this ABS module and whatever this BAR is. So if we click on this BAR module, you'll see that that is the battery regulation. That's not communicating as well. Well, I say that, but it could also mean that this vehicle just isn't equipped with that module. We can even check on this AHF module. You'll see that's a trailer function. This vehicle does not have a trailer, so I'm not going to worry about these two modules here. The one I'm mostly concerned with is this ABS module, and as you guys can see, it's not communicating. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's go ahead and start taking this thing apart.
All right, guys, so here we have the ABS module. You can see I already went ahead and disconnected the electrical connector. Now, in order to remove this module, it looks like we're gonna have to remove the entire ABS pump and module assembly. By the way, if you guys didn't know, this plastic part here is the actual ABS control module, and the rest of this here is the pump assembly. These two pieces are actually bolted together. Now, in a perfect world, this module would have been facing this direction here, and we would have been able to gain access to the bolts, here you can see one of them. However, you guys can see that's not the case. This module is facing up against the firewall over here. And so there is no way for me to get to the bolts that attach this thing to the pump. So I'm gonna go ahead and unbolt these lines and pull this pump assembly out. All right guys, so I managed to get the ABS module and pump assembly out of the vehicle. I'm sorry, I did try to film a cool time lapse for you guys. However, it was pretty much just my hairy arm in front of the camera the whole time. Anyway, so here we have the electrical connector and if I flip it around, you can see that we basically just have three Torx bolts holding this thing in. So I'm gonna go ahead and unbolt this module and then we'll take it over to our workbench and see if we can fix this thing. All right guys, so here we are at my workstation. I managed to get this ABS module opened up. I did, however, have to use a rotary tool uh, to cut around the edge, so no big deal. This thing should glue right back together, no problem. Anyway, so now that we got this thing opened up, let's take a close look at it and see if we can find anything obvious, maybe like a blown capacitor, maybe signs of water intrusion, burnt contacts, anything like that. Now, honestly, I've already taken a close look at this board and I can tell you right now, there's nothing really obvious here that looks bad. We've got a capacitor over here, but as you can see, it looks nice and clean. It's not bulging or anything like that. If you take a look at the contacts on the board, you can see that they all pretty much look nice and clean. There's no signs here of water intrusion. I mean, I haven't tested any components yet, but just looking at this thing, it looks pretty good. Now, the one thing I will say is a little bit of a concern to me is the fact that these pins up here for the connector are not actually soldered to the board. So if I flip this around, you can see that that's our electrical connector. Those are the pins that go into the other side of the board here. And then if you look at these pins, let me see if I can focus in on that. Let me try to show you through the magnifying glass. Okay, so if you look closely at these pins for the connector, you'll notice that these are actually not soldered into place. These are pretty much just pushed through and kind of press fitted into place. Now I have read online that these can be problematic with a lot of these boards. Over time, you might have some issues with connections because these pins are really only making contact where they're press fitted in. So what I wanna do is essentially just go through and solder all of these pins into place. That way we know for sure that we have a good connection. Now I did also notice that while looking around the rest of the board, we do have several of these push through pins that are not soldered into place. So there's a couple right here that we're gonna solder up. We got another couple right here. We've got another couple right here. Uh, there's four of them right here. And so basically I'm just gonna go around the board, find all of these pins that are pushed through and we're just gonna solder them into place. All right guys, so real quick, before I actually solder anything together, I wanna do a quick check on the bench to see if we can communicate with our ABS module. So if you take a look over here, we have our go diag, and this is basically like a breakout that allows us to connect directly to the module. Then if you look over here, you can see I have the scan tool connected through our smart box interface to the go diag. And essentially what I did was I looked at the wiring diagram here and I found our main powers and ground. So if you take a look here, we've got a main power on pin number one. We've got a main power on pin number 14. We also have an ignition power on pin number 20. Then we have a ground here on pin number 26. Those are our main powers and grounds. Now the other two important lines that we wanna to connect to are going to be our CAN high and CAN low lines. And so if you take a look here at pin number 21 and pin number 23, 
Those are gonna be our computer data lines, also known as the CAN high and CAN low. So if I take you guys over to the ABS module, you can see that right here, I've got my leads attached from the go diag to our main powers and grounds. And we also have our two CAN lines right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this module up on my little koozie here. And over here, you can see that we have a switch for our battery voltage power going to the module. Then we also have a power switch for the ignition voltage. Now pins number six and 14 are going to be our CAN high and CAN low. And if you look, I went ahead and I put 120 ohm resistor between the two. Now let me take you guys over to the scan tool. And what we're going to do is we are going to select the ABS module number three. We're gonna click enter and see if we have communication. And if you take a look over here at the go diag, whenever we have CAN communication happening, what you're gonna see are these lights blinking on pins number four and 16. Right now you can see that they're not blinking at all, showing us that we don't have any CAN communication and it looks like this thing just failed. Yeah, so take a look at that communication error with vehicle ECU. So we don't have any communication even on the bench. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and solder up this board and we're going to see if that fixes our communication problem. guys so i managed to get these pins soldered up into place however even after doing that we still have no communication so even when i do try to communicate we don't have any blinking lights on the can high and can low here on the go diag i mean it does blink for a second or two when the scan tool is initially trying to communicate however once they go out these lines are dead so obviously there's something else going on here it's not going to be as cut and dry as i was hoping it looks like we're gonna have to do some component testing here and I think I'm going to start by checking these transistors over here. We also got one over here. Well, they look like transistors. They may be something else. Sometimes these things can fool you. So the best thing to do is to look at the number labeled on the component, Google it, and a lot of times you can find the data sheets from the manufacturer. So I'm going to run the numbers on these parts here and we'll see what they are. All right, guys. So fast forward, after doing a little bit of research, I was able to find the data sheets on these two chips here. And what I found out is that this one here is actually a shock key rectifier. And this one over here is in fact a transistor, which kind of makes sense because if you look here, these pins are for the main powers coming into the board. And if you follow the path here, it goes straight to this rectifier. So that's definitely something we want to check. Now, let me take you guys over to the board and show you how I'm going to test these things. All right, guys. So after a quick Google search, I ran the numbers on the components and I was able to determine that one of our components is actually a power shock key rectifier. And the other one is a MOSFET transistor. Now, if you look up at the screen, we got the data sheet pulled up for our shock key rectifier. Now, this is basically just a fast switching diode. And if you know anything about diodes, their job is to allow current to only flow in one direction. And so if you take a look at the little diagram we have right here, uh, that's basically what this is. It's a diode. So if you look at the A terminals, these are going to be our inputs. Then if you look at the K, this is going to be the output. Now the arrow here in the middle does determine the direction of the current flow. And so if you look, you can see that current can only flow from point A to point K. Now, if you look down here, you can see they give us a little picture of what our component looks like. And on our terminals A, those are gonna be our inputs. And then our terminal K is going to be our output. Now, what we're gonna do in order to test this component is we are going to take a multimeter. And in this case, our box is going to represent our multimeter. Now you're gonna to wanna to set your multimeter to a diode testing mode, which is basically a continuity test. And it's also gonna give us a voltage reading, but we'll get to that in a second. Now, the first thing we want to do is we want to take our positive lead and we're going to want to touch either one of the A terminals. Again, these are our inputs. Then we're going to take the negative lead and we're going to touch the terminal K. 
Now, if you guys didn't know, when you put your multimeter in a continuity test mode, essentially what the meter does is it's going to send out a small trickle voltage on the positive lead, and it's going to look for that voltage to show up on the negative lead. That's how it tests for resistance. So with our connection set up this way, as long as we have a good diode, we should show continuity and we should get an audible beep from our meter. If we don't have continuity, then we know that there's an open inside of the component. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to switch it up and we want to take our positive lead and we want to touch it to the K terminal. Then we want to take our negative lead and touch it to either one of the A terminals. Now as long as this diode is in good condition, it should stop the flow of current in this direction and we should not have any continuity. If we do have continuity in this direction, then we know our component is bad. That's basically how we're gonna test this component. Very quick, simple, easy test to do. Now, one thing I will add is that if you're gonna be testing a component like this, it is recommended to remove the component from the board before you test it. Sometimes if you test the component while it's still on the board, you can end up with some really erratic or unreliable results. Now, in our case, I'm not gonna be pulling this off of the board. I really just wanna do a quick test, so hopefully we can get some reliable results while it's still on the board. All right, so we're gonna start by testing our shock key. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take my meter and I'm gonna go into the digital meter and we're gonna go down to diode continuity. I'm gonna go ahead and touch my leads together so that I can calibrate it. Now what you guys are hearing is the beep from the meter. Essentially what this setting does is not only does it measure continuity, it also measures voltage drop across the circuit. So when I touch these two leads together, that means that we have continuity and we get an audible beep. So I'm going to start by putting our positive lead on one of the A terminals. Then we're going to touch the K terminal to see if we have continuity. You guys can see here on the meter, we're looking at 226 millivolts. From experience, I expect to see somewhere between 100 millivolts and maybe somewhere around 600 millivolts. Of course, that varies. But to me, this looks like a normal reading. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the other A terminal and take a look at what our meter says, 225 millivolts. So that looks like a good reading. Now what I wanna do is test this in the opposite direction. So I'm gonna take my positive lead and I'm gonna touch it to the K terminal. Then we're gonna take our negative lead and we're gonna touch one of the A terminals and we should not have any continuity. We're just showing arrows, which means as far as resistance, we're over the limit here. That's exactly what we wanna see. We don't wanna see continuity in this direction. So I'm gonna take my negative lead and I'm gonna to touch the other A terminal and you guys can see we have the same thing. No continuity in this direction. That's exactly what we wanna see. This here is a good diode. Now, when it comes to testing our transistor, we're gonna be doing this a little bit differently. If you take a look up here at the screen, I do have the data sheet for our transistor. Now, the one that we have is gonna be this TO252 style. And if I take you over to this page, they give us a little diagram of how this component works. Basically, if you look, we have the source, we have the drain, and then we have the gate, which is our control. Now, basically the transistor is much like a switch. In its normal state, it's gonna be open and there's not gonna be a connection between the source and the drain. However, when you apply a voltage to the gate, that's going to close the circuit and allow current to flow from the drain to the source. Now, if you look up here over to the right-hand side, you can see that they give us a little layout of our transistor. Now, if you look at the way this thing is laid out, you can see that we have four terminals. Three of them on the front, one, two, three, and then number four on the back side. Now, number four and number two are actually the same. This terminal essentially extends from the back over to the front on terminal number two, and you can see they kind of cut off the leg of this terminal. So when we do our testing, we could test it either way by touching uh, terminal four on the back side or terminal two on the front side. Now, if you look over here to the right-hand side, you can see that terminal number one is gonna be the gate. Terminal number two is gonna be the drain. Terminal number three is the source. And terminal number four, again, is gonna be the drain as well. So once again, terminal one is going to be our gate. Terminal three is gonna be our source. And terminal four is gonna be our drain. Now the way that we're gonna test this is we're gonna take our multimeter and we're gonna start by putting our negative lead on our source pin. Again, our multimeter is still gonna be under a diode continuity test mode. And so we are basically doing a continuity check. Now with our positive lead, we're gonna go ahead and attach that to our drain. Again, terminal number four on the back side of the transistor. And at this point, as long as this transistor is in good condition, we should not have continuity. Remember, the transistor is basically an open switch in its normal state. 
there's not going to be a connection between our source and our drain until a voltage is applied on our gate terminal. So in order to test the switching capability of the transistor, it's actually really easy. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to take our positive lead, move it away from the drain, and what we're going to do is we're going to take it and briefly touch on the gate pin. Like I mentioned before, when our meter is in a continuity test mode, it's actually going to send out a trickle voltage on the positive lead. So we're going to use that voltage to energize the gate pin of the transistor. Now you only have to touch the gate pin briefly, but when you do this and you go back to the drain with your positive lead, as long as this transistor is in good condition, the switch should be closed and we should have continuity and we should get an audible beep from our meter. Now, one interesting thing I would like to add is that when you do the switching test, you'll see that it actually holds this switch closed for a pretty good while. Now, the reason for that is because internally, when you power up this gate pin, it kind of acts like a capacitor and it stores that energy. One thing I like to do is actually short these two pins together in order to discharge the capacitor. Again, this center pin right here is part of our drain. And so when you touch these two pins together, that should drain the capacitor and this switch should open. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Now let's move back over to the board and test this thing. Okay, so moving over to our transistor, I'm gonna start by putting our negative lead on our source pin. Then I'm gonna take the positive lead and we're gonna touch the drain. And as you guys can see, we do not have any continuity. That's exactly what we want to see. Now we could also touch this terminal here in the middle. That's also the drain. This tab basically just extends to the back over here. So you could really touch it either way, up front over here or out back over here. I'm going to do it this way just so it's easier for you guys to see. But if you look at the meter, no matter where I touch it on the drain, we do not have continuity. That's exactly what we want to see. Now, in order to test this transistor, we're just going to briefly touch the gate pin with the positive lead, that's going to briefly energize the base circuit of this transistor and create a path from source to drain. So I'm gonna go ahead and touch the gate pin just briefly, then we're gonna move back to our drain and take a look at the meter over here. You can see that we did have continuity there for a moment. It kind of came and went pretty quickly, so let me do that again for you guys. I'm gonna touch the gate pin and then we're gonna switch back to our drain and you guys can see we have continuity there and then it goes away. That shows us that the transistor is switching. So according to this test, this transistor is good. Now we do have another transistor, this really big one over here. Let me try to frame it in the middle of the camera. Okay, so this transistor here is a MOSFET transistor. I was able to find the data sheet on it. And so basically it's pretty much the same test that we did on this transistor. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my negative lead and I'm gonna touch the source. Then I'm gonna take my positive lead and we're gonna touch the drain. And as you guys can see, we do not have any continuity. I can also touch the drain here on the center pin. And once again, you can see that we do not have any continuity on the meter. That's exactly what we want to see. Now let's go ahead and power up the base circuit of the transistor. So I'm going to touch pin number one, which is our gate pin. Then I'm going to move back to our drain and we're going to see if we have any continuity. Okay, I didn't see any change there. Let's go back and power this up. Make sure we got a good connection. Okay, so I'm touching the gate. We're going to move back to the drain and I don't see any change. Let's try touching the center pin. So again, I'm going to power up the gate just briefly, and then we're gonna switch over to the drain, the middle pin. And again, guys, take a look at the meter. You can see that we have no change at all. This transistor is not switching at all. So I think we may have found our culprit here. All right, guys, just for shimmies and giggles, I think that I may just go ahead and remove this transistor from the board. That way we can test it on the bench without it being attached to the rest of the circuitry. So let me go ahead and pull this thing off. Alright guys, so I went ahead and I removed our transistor from our circuit board. As you can see, I also went ahead and removed the other two. Again, this is our other transistor and this is our shock key rectifier. And so we're going to start by testing the big transistor. I'm going to go ahead and take my negative lead and I'm going to touch it to the source. Then I'm going to take our positive, we're going to touch it to the drain. As you guys can see, we don't have any continuity here. So I'm going to go ahead and do our switching test. I'm going to touch our gate pin just briefly and then we're going to move back to our drain. And as you guys can see, we do have continuity. Now, again, when we do this switching test, this basically works like a capacitor in such a way that it's actually gonna keep the connection for a while until we short these pins out. So again, you can see I'm touching this and you can see we do still have connection between the source and the drain. Now I'm just gonna take my finger and I'm going to touch the gate pin and our drain pin. Again, this pin in the middle right here that's cut off, 
that's part of the drain that's on the back side over here. So this pad that's on the back is also this little pin here on the front. So again, I'm just gonna take my finger and touch these two together. And what that's going to do is that's going to drain our capacitor. And then we're gonna come back over here and you guys can see that we no longer have continuity between our source and our drain. And again, we're gonna do the switching test one more time just to verify, I'm gonna to touch it briefly. Then we're gonna move back to the drain. And again, you guys can see that we do have continuity. And like I said, as long as it holds it for a while, you know this thing is good. So, you know, you can see that right now I'm giving it a, a few seconds and then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna touch it. And we're gonna see that we still have continuity here. And then I'm just gonna take my finger, we're gonna touch the gate and the drain together. And then we're gonna come back and double check to see if it switched back off. Oh, I must not have made good contact. There might still be some flux on these pins here. So let me make sure I got good contact. Okay, we'll try it again. You guys can see that we no longer have continuity. So that just proves to us that this transistor is good. There's definitely a difference between testing this thing on the circuit board and testing it here on the bench. Again, guys, sometimes you can get away with testing it on the board, but in order to get accurate results, the best way to do it is to remove it from the board and just test the component by itself. So we're gonna move over to testing our other transistor, the smaller one, and we're basically gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna to touch our negative lead to the source pin, and then I'm gonna to touch the positive lead to the drain pin. And as you guys can see, we do not have any continuity here, and we're gonna do our switching test. So I'm gonna go ahead and briefly touch the gate pin, and I'm gonna come back to our drain pin. And as you guys can see, we do have continuity. And again, like I said, it should hold that continuity for quite some time until we short out the gate and the drain pin. So I'm gonna come back over here and show you guys that we still have a closed switch. And so you can see on the meter that we do have full continuity. And if I go ahead and take my finger and just touch the uh, gate pin with the drain pin, that's going to short it out. And then we're gonna come back over here and see that we no longer have continuity. So that transistor is also good. So now that we know that all these components are good, I'm gonna go ahead and solder them back to the board and let's continue with our testing. All right guys, so I went ahead and I soldered the components back onto the board. Now there is a slight change of plans. I have been keeping an eye out for listings on eBay for a replacement module. And the past couple weeks, I haven't seen anything online. However, today a listing just popped up for a replacement module. Now it is a used one. And honestly, I'm not exactly sure if we can even use a used module on this vehicle because I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to change the VIN number in it. But the price is so good that honestly, I'm afraid I'm missing out on it. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and buy it. And even if we can't use it and change the VIN number in it, you know, we could probably even still use it for parts in order to fix this one. Or maybe we can even do, uh, you know, EEPROM extraction where we can take the information from the EEPROM chip here and move it over to the other one. I'm not sure, but honestly, like I said, the price right now is so cheap that it would be dumb not to just go ahead and buy it. And so what I'm gonna do for now is I'm gonna put this thing on the back burner, order the used replacement module. Then when it gets here, we'll see what we can do with it. One week later. All right, guys, fast forward. Our donor module just came in the mail today. Here we have it. Like I said, I got this thing used off of eBay. It was the only one that I could find that had the exact same part number. So if you guys take a look here, um, this shows to be one that does not have the ESP and it's a 26 pin. So again, matching numbers on this part. And as you guys can see that they did give us the VIN number off of the donor vehicle right here which uh, happens to be a 2007 Jetta, which is basically the same thing as the Rabbit that we're working on. And so before I do anything else, the first thing that I wanna do just to get it out of the way is I wanna go ahead and connect this to the Go Diag on the bench. And I wanna make sure that we even have communication with this because if this is a bad module, I kinda wanna know right away. So let me go ahead and connect the wires here and then uh, we'll see if we got communication. Okay, so I've got our powers and grounds connected, also our can lines, everything is hooked up to the Go Diag. Right now everything's powered up. So I'm gonna go over to the scan tool and we are going to click on ABS and we want to see whether or not we have communication. So there's the ABS module, we're gonna hit enter. Sorry about the glare in the background, let me close that window. Okay, so hopefully that's a little bit better. Now let's go ahead and click enter and we are going to see if we have communication. And really for me, what I wanna know is whether or not we may have some type of function in the scan tool that allows us to change the VIN number because again, this is a used module. And what I'm concerned with is that we're not going to be able to use it unless we swap over the VIN number. And so 
Hopefully there is a function for us to be able to do that and that we don't have to do this through the EEPROM. And so you guys can see that uh, it is communicating here. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Uh-oh, that's not good. Okay, so we're showing a communication error just like we did on the last one. I really hope this isn't a bad module. I wonder what would happen if I just went ahead and connected it to the vehicle and connected the scan tool that way to see if maybe uh, we got communication. Yeah, I think I'm gonna try that real quick. All right guys, so I went ahead and I plugged in our ABS module. You can see it propped up over here. I don't have the lines connected. I just connected the electrical connector. As you guys can see, I have a battery charger on this right now because the battery is completely dead. And up here, I have my scan tool. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn the ignition on. Got the key right here. Ignition is on. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the scan tool. Let's go ahead and do a full scan here. You can see we're scanning the ECM. We did find nine trouble codes, the TCM, and now it's time for the ABS. Bam, check it out, guys. We have communication with the ABS module. That was pretty quick. Eight codes stored. Let it finish scanning the rest of the modules here. All right, so it looks like we got codes in pretty much all of the modules, except this uh, WEG module. I don't know what that is, but uh, actually we can click on it and it'll give us a description. Oh, Anti-theft immobilizer. So we're not really concerned with that. Uh, what we want to know is whether or not we have ABS communication. And as you guys can see, it does look like we are communicating with the ABS module. Now, what's really important here is we want to know whether or not there's some type of function in the scan tool that allows us to change the VIN number. And so, of course, we've got a ton of different codes uh, right now because, of course, like I said, the battery was completely dead. So it doesn't surprise me that we have a bunch of different faults and also because this ABS module came off of a different vehicle. And so more than likely, it probably has the wrong VIN number in there and also the wrong coding. And so that's why all of the modules are flagging that there's a problem with the ABS module. And so we're not really gonna pay attention too much to the fault codes. I wanna know whether or not we can go in here and first of all, communicate with the ABS module and see if we can replace the VIN number. So here we have the read ECU memory. It's giving us a basic overview of our ABS module. You can see it's got our coding information. That's our coding number that's stored in this used module. And we have our VIN number here, which is the VIN number that came off of the donor vehicle. Wait, actually, uh, you know what? Now that I look at this, this actually looks like the VIN number off of this car. So let me show you real quick. If you take a look at the last four digits, 8957, uh, down here, you can see 8957. That's the VIN number from this car, and I'll show you guys over here on the window. Take a look right here. You can see that uh, the last four digits, 8957. Now, if we compare that to the VIN number that's on the used module, remember they put a sticker on here that showed us the VIN number of the donor vehicle. You can see that our last four digits are 0235. Yeah, so we're showing the actual VIN number of the car on that scan tool. I wonder if that's just some kind of default here. So let's go ahead and go into the module. And uh, yeah, let's go to module information up here. And so this is gonna tell us the actual information in the module. And we're gonna see what VIN number we have. Take a look here. Check it out, 8957. Okay, so that's the VIN number of this car. I don't know what just happened. Did this ABS module suck in the VIN number from the ECM or something? It's quite possible. I mean, I've run across this before where, uh, you know, installing a module into the vehicle, it basically just automatically inhales the VIN number uh, from one of the other modules that are on the system. And so I'm thinking that might be what happened here. Let's scroll down and see if there's any uh, special functions that allow us to uh, change the VIN number here. I mean, we do have the ability to code the module, but that's something completely different, which is actually something I'm gonna show you guys in a minute because we do still have to code this module. But what I'm thinking is that we may not actually have to worry about swapping the VIN number on this thing. And now I'm curious as to why I wasn't able to communicate with that module on the bench. I'm starting to think that maybe I did something wrong. So just for my own curiosity, I think I'm gonna take it back off and reconnect to it on the bench. All right guys, so my fault. I had the ignition power on the wrong pin. This uh, wire here should be on pin number 20. And for some reason, I thought it should have been on pin number 16. That was my fault. I have it on the correct pin now. And as you guys can see, we do have communication. Take a look at the scan tool here. And what's even more awesome is that if we click on ABS, I'm gonna click enter, take a look at our module information. Again, we're disconnected from the vehicle here. So 
the vehicle has no influence on what's happening here on the bench and take a look at our VIN number here. Our last four, eight, nine, five, seven. That is the correct VIN number for the vehicle. And so even if we go in here and we'll go into module information in the ABS module, you guys can see again, the same VIN number, eight, nine, five, seven. This VIN number has been written into this donor module without us even doing anything. Basically, as soon as we plugged it in, it sucked in the VIN number from one of the other modules on the vehicle. That means that we don't have to worry at all about programming the VIN number into this module, which was my biggest concern to begin with. Now, the other crazy thing about this, and I was just thinking about it, is that this mistake that I made as far as putting the power on the wrong pin actually saved me a lot of time. I'm pretty sure that if I was able to get this thing to communicate the first time I hooked it up to the Go Diag right out of the box, I would have seen the VIN number that was stored into this module and I would have looked in the scan tool for some type of function to change the VIN number. And if I wouldn't have found that function, then I probably would have gone the route of trying to swap over the EEPROM information from this module to this module. Again, guys, our EEPROM chip right here. Now, again, the problem is, is that this module was never really designed to be opened. And so I would have had to cut open the new module, or I say new, but this is a used module. You guys know what I mean. Anyway, I would have ended up cutting this module open and trying to do an EEPROM read and write without even knowing whether or not that was gonna be successful. Again, guys, I really couldn't find any information online telling me whether or not it was possible to even do this. So just seeing this work out in my favor, it's just something really awesome. I don't know how to explain it, guys, but I think I got really lucky here when I made this mistake because again, the only reason I plugged this into the car was because I thought that it might've been a dead module, but plugging it into the car was exactly what I needed to do because now that we plugged it into the car, it sucked in the correct VIN number for the car and we don't have to worry about messing with it. Now, the only thing left to do here is code the module, and I'm pretty sure this is something we can probably do on the bench, but I'm gonna go ahead and install this into the vehicle, take you guys back into the garage, and I'll show you how we code this module. Okay, so we're back in the garage. Once again, I've got the ABS module connected to the vehicle. Now, let me take you guys over to the scan tool and show you how we're gonna code this. Now, I know as far as coding, especially when it comes to European vehicles, there's a lot of mystery behind it, but honestly, it's actually a really simple procedure, especially now that we have scan tools like this one. I know back in the day before we had scan tools like this one, you used to have to use a much more complicated software to go in there and code everything line by line, but essentially this thing does it all online and it does it with pretty much just the touch of a button. So let me take you guys over to online functions. Now we're gonna go ahead and select online coding. And of course you wanna make sure that you are connected to the Wi-Fi. You guys can see my little Wi-Fi signal is showing that I do have good connection. And you also wanna make sure that you have a charger on the car. You don't want the battery getting low whenever you're doing this. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into single system mode, which basically lets me select just one module. And we're gonna select module number three, which is brake electronics. It says here, click to code. We clicked it. It's gonna download the files there. You can see it showing that we do have some code. So let's go ahead and erase those. We'll click yes. Fault codes are cleared. We'll hit yes. No fault codes, we'll hit okay. Then we'll click on obtain factory code. Okay, so it says here, if the current coding data does not match, you can attempt to obtain the factory code of the current system online with this function. That's exactly what we're trying to do here. And it says here, this function must be performed at the specific interval uh, and must not be performed frequently. Really, you only wanna do this whenever you're replacing a module or where you have an event where the coding is not correct. You need to go in here and change it. It also says here, this function cannot guarantee that the factory code will be obtained. So like I said, it's gonna to try to pull the information from online. We're gonna click on okay. And again, it's doing this based on the VIN number. So as long as we got the correct VIN number in there, it should pull the correct information from the servers. And it says here, succeeded to request a server and upload file, waiting for the server to return data. And it says here, connecting, it says succeeded. And now we've got our information here. Let's go ahead and click on perform. And it is going to perform the coding. The coding has been successfully carried out. It is that easy, guys. Let's go ahead and back out. And what I wanna do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a complete scan. And then we're gonna clear all of the codes in all of the modules. And then we're gonna see if we were able to fix our problem. So I'm gonna run the scan right now. Okay, so we're finished scanning all the modules. I'm gonna go ahead and click on clear DTCs. And it's gonna run through and clear them all. All right, so we're done clearing all of the fault codes and you can see that we're pretty much all green except for the EPS, which is the electronic power steering. So if we click here, you can see that 
Uh, there's a thing for the steering angle sensor, which I'm pretty sure has to be relearned. So again, we replaced the ABS module. It's probably required that we have to go in here and do a steering angle relearn. And I believe we should be able to find that under special functions up here. Uh, yeah, right there, steering angle learning. Looks like we got three different places we need to do this. So we'll start with the brake electronics. It says here, start the vehicle, drive a short distance, have it on the level surface. While driving, turn the steering wheel, one turn to the right and one turn to the left. When having the steering wheel straight, again, stop the vehicle with the wheels pointed straight. Ensure that the steering wheel is not moved again. Keep the engine running and do not switch off the ignition. I don't have the brake lines connected, so I think I should probably go ahead and do that first before I do the steering angle relearn. So let me go ahead and connect everything up, bleed the brakes. That way I can drive the car around. Then we'll come back and we'll do the steering angle relearn. All right, guys, to so fast forward, I've got the ABS module installed. Take a look, you can see it back here. I've got all of the brake lines connected. Everything's already bled. And I also went ahead and I put brand new brakes all the way around, pads and rotors, uh, front and back, because again, like I said, this car had been sitting for over a year. And so the brakes were really, really rusted. Take a look at the rotor over here. You can see how rusted this thing was. So yeah, we got brakes all the way around. All right, guys, so here we are on our first official test drive. I've only been driving now for a couple of minutes. And uh, if you take a look at the instrument cluster, you can see that, uh, you know, as soon as I made the round about at the cul-de-sac, um, our little steering wheel light went away. So it looks like all you had to do really to uh, reset the steering angle was turn the steering wheel all the way to the left and then all the way to the right uh, and drive the vehicle. And then the light went away. So looks like that's all set. Other than that, the car drives great. Now we did do a lot of other work to it. I replaced the control arms, the ball joints. Like I showed you guys previously, I did the front and rear brakes, pads and rotors. I also did a complete flush on the brake system, changed the air filter, changed the oil, all that kinds of good stuff. And so this car is ready to rock and roll. Again, take a look at the instrument cluster. You can see that our speedometer is working now. Before our speedometer was not working and we had the ABS light, traction light, all that good stuff. Now the only thing that we have left is, uh, of course, there's an airbag light here. It's got some codes for the passenger and driver's side airbags, but uh, those things are not related to the repair. Also, you can see that we do have a little light bulb sign popping up right here. That's popping up because uh, one of the brake light bulbs is out, so I do need to replace that. We still got that little sign for the washer fluid up there. Other than that, like I said, the car drives great. I would definitely call that a fix. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully we were able to help you out, maybe answer some of your questions as to whether or not you can actually put a used module in one of these Volkswagens. As you guys saw, I was able to install the module. We didn't have to program the VIN. It basically just sucked up the VIN number as soon as we plugged it in. Now, the only thing that you may need to have is a capable scan tool to do the coding. But as you guys saw in the video, coding is really easy to do on these cars. So anyways, like I always say, thank you guys for watching. I hope you found it useful, informational, educational, entertaining. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.